Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shannon Erickson. I work as a graduate student uh, in Dr. Warren's lab at Duke University. Um, and today I'm going to be talking about uh, two state saver and some of these enhanced uh, hyperpolarization that we're getting from some non intuitive pole sequences. Um, so, SABER uh, uses parahydrogen to overpopulate an initial singlet hydride state on our polarization transfer or complex, which is shown here. Um, our target nucleus, which I'm showing here, is a 15N. Uh, in this representation, can be any really spin half heteronucleus or proton. Um, so, moving forward, I'm just going to be using an L to represent an arbitrary ligand uh, target nucleus here. Um, and this target nucleus is initially thermally distributed between our alpha and beta states. Um, but we're targeting unidirectional spin flips with this process. So the initial state that I've arbitrarily chosen here is just singlet hydrides with an alpha target nucleus. Um, we end up exposing this initial state to some magnetic field conditions in order to facilitate transfer of spin population. Um, and then we have our overpopulated singlet spin state is then converted into an overpopulated magnetized state, in this case, beta on the ligand nucleus. Um, the reversible exchange bit of SABER then ends up replenishing that initial state, uh, and the process can begin again. So moving forward, I just wanted to introduce the polarization transfer complex that I've been using for all of my experimental data that I'm going to present here, um, and the DME XFR2 numerical simulations that I'm going to be uh, showing with that. Um, so this is our iridium catalyst here, and in the axial positions, we do have ligands here, but they're unimportant for the purpose of this talk, so I've just truncated those out into spheres. Um, we have parahydrogen associated in the equatorial plane over here. Our target ligand here is 15 N-acetonitrile with our target nucleus of 15 N here, coupled out to the three methyl protons out here. Um, and then finally, we have a silent co-ligand that we use to stabilize the complex, which is just unlabeled pyridine. Um, and uh, traditional continuous field experiments are utilized level anti-crossings to kind of match what field is going to facilitate that population transfer between coupled spin states. Um, and the lack matching condition for actually passing this population into positively or negatively mag magnetized states uh, occurs when the resonance frequency difference uh, between the hydrides and the target nucleus is on the order of the primary J couplings of the system. Um, these matching fields are shown down here. Um, and they're shown as these vertical dashed lines that I've plotted here, along with uh, experimental data for signal enhancement in a one Tesla NMR at some magnetic field B, um, is shown here with an overlaid with a numerical or numerically simulated magnetic field suite. Um, and it's easy to see here that the level anti-crossing matching condition has been a really good predictor for uh, magnetic fields that we should be using for facilitating polarization transfer um, under these standard thermodynamic conditions in a continuous field experiment. Um, so I'm pulling out here the optimal polarization transfer condition, which is occurring somewhere around minus uh, 0.6 microtesla. Um, and we can see the polarization buildup over time, which is a, a simulated trace here. Um, we get very reasonable polarization transfer under these conditions. Um, but I'm interested in seeing what happens when we apply this very non-intuitive pulse sequence. So we're starting at a pulse at, or a three millisecond long pulse at zero microtesla. Uh, which lands here. And we would expect to get zero net polarization transfer from that condition. And then we move on to a higher field pulse, or at least what I would consider higher field, given that 95% of my graduate work has been at sub -micro Tesla. Um, and we, once again, would expect to see no polarization transfer under the level anti-crossing interpretation. Um, and so now we're applying two successive fields in which do not individually result in polarization transfer. Um, and if the enormous space that I left blank up here didn't give it away, um, we actually generate more polarization and get improved uh, theoretical yield by up to 2.4 times with just this, this simple addition to the pulse sequence. Um, so to explain this improvement under these highly non-intuitive conditions, uh, we have to turn to perturbation theory in order to tease apart the time dependence of some of the interactions with our Hamiltonian. Um, so evolution of the system can be described by the Lugo von Neumann equation, which I've shown right here. Um, this can be expressed as the time continuous propagation of our density matrix, which is actually the method that we use for all of our numerical simulations. Um, but we can alternatively express the solution as the Taylor series expansion, which assigns a time dependence to the various spin operator terms that are being generated by this interaction. Um, so as we look at spin operator terms that are generated in the higher order terms of this expansion, uh, we see that they actually grow in slower with this higher order dependence on T. Um, and they require more interactions with the Hamiltonian in order to generate those spin operator terms. So first order terms will require one interaction or rotation under the Hamiltonian and they will grow in linearly. 
Second order terms require two interactions and they will grow quadratically. Um, and then we have our third order and fourth order terms and so on. Um, and we can use this to uh, highlight various coherence transfer pathways through our Hamiltonian um, and tease out which terms in the nuclear spin Hamiltonian actually interact meaningfully with our spin system, uh, as well as the order in which those interactions have to take place in order to generate our target uh, spin states. Um, so now let's apply this to our spin system. Um, I'm going to be moving into a, a pictorial representation of coherence transfer pathways. So this color scheme up here will make sense eventually. Um, and I've written out the Hamiltonian here for a three spin Y system, which is basically uh, composed of two our, of our hydrides, which have their Larmor terms here, our target ligand nucleus with its Larmor term here, a J coupling between one of our hydrides and our target nucleus, so JLH, and the JHH between the two hydrides. Um, our initial density matrix uh, has singlet order on the hydrides and thermally polarized ligand target ligand nucleus, which can be approximated as identity. So we're starting off with a uh, initial density matrix that looks like this. Um, and uh, we can follow through with this diagram, which shows a pictorial representation of the coherence transfer pathways in the system, uh, where these connecting lines are showing which terms in the Hamiltonian are leading to which spin operator terms and the higher, higher order terms in the expansion. Um, are reached after each successive interaction. So first, uh, you have your first order term, which is generated by interacting uh, your initial density matrix with uh, the JLH, which is incidentally the only term that doesn't actually, that doesn't commute with the initial density matrix. Um, and then we're generating our first order term here. Um, the first term in this Taylor series expansion where we see direct magnetization generated um, on our target nucleus is the, first, is the fourth order term, so row four way out here. Uh, our target pathways to actually generate that LZ magnetization must go through one rotation under the JLH term, uh, one rotation under the resonance offset term and the JHH term. Um, the order of those rotations actually doesn't matter because they commute with one another. And then one final rotation under the JLH term. Um, it's also important to note here that uh, it's specifically the transverse terms in the JLH coupling that provide the necessary rotations for polarization transfer. Um, so we have to be in the strong coupling limit in order for those terms to be accessible. Um, so returning to the continuous field experiments, um, all of these rotations have to be optimized simultaneously in order to generate uh, polarization in the fourth order term, which has a T to the fourth dependence. Um, so to clearly demonstrate this dependence, I've just plotted the initial behavior for a polarization buildup curve for just a standard continuous field experiment, uh, where we'd be able to isolate the time dependence without uh, having significant interference from exchange and other effects. Um, so this is the polarization that's measured every tenth of a millisecond for just three milliseconds, and I fit it here with a t to the fourth curve with a, a very high degree of accuracy just to clearly or demonstrate that uh, time dependence. Um, uh, so the problem that we run into here is that two of the rotations that we need to utilize under this continuous field uh, actually are optimized at opposing field conditions. So that resonance frequency uh, difference will scale linearly with the applied field. Uh, so the larger the field, the larger the difference there. Uh, but at high field, we actually enter the weak coupling regime where the transverse terms in this JLH coupling are rotated out of phase and are no longer active. Those transverse terms are instead optimized at zero field where the resonance frequency then drops to zero. So we have an opposing uh, uh, forces acting on this. Um, and a happy medium can be found at the level anti-crossing where both of these terms would be active. Um, but another problem that we run into there is that all of the coherence transfer pathways are then active uh, at all times during that, that magnetic field application. Uh, which leads to the generation of many off-target spin operator terms flowing down different coherence transfer pathways. Uh, Two-state Sabre uh, is able to circumvent this problem by applying fields in a sequence which uh, mirrors the on-target coherence transfer pathway and then separately optimizes the JLH and the resonance frequency difference. Um, so this zero field pulse that we start out with uh, optimizes evolution under that JLH term. Uh, the higher field pulse then facilitates evolution under the resonance frequency difference. Um, and then we start our next pulse, which begins with another zero field pulse, which either finishes transfer on some complexes and begins this process on other complexes. Um, and we can freely optimize each of these terms separately and uh, at the same time favor coherence transfer pathways that have this alternating structure uh, that we can see with our on target pathways. And it also will inhibit the transfer down pathways that don't have the structure. Um, so why did I choose this set of conditions for this example sequence? 13.41 is a pretty precise value just to be arbitrary. Um, and what parameters can we actually use for this pulse to get the benefits of this pulse sequence? Um, so let's look at the polarization transfer under this uh, arbitrary pulse sequence that I'm showing here. Um, so first, we're just going to consider what we would expect just through the level anti-crossing transfer picture alone. 
Um, and we would still see polarization buildup. And we would see this build up around conditions where the average field over the course of this pulse packet um, would be equal to the level anti-crossing matching condition. Um, just to orient everyone to this plot over here, uh, we're scanning through the polarization, polarization that is generated under this pulse sequence uh, with a field strength BD and a duration tau D. Um, and I've plotted this white line here, uh, which uh, is where the level anti-crossing matching condition is perfectly matched. Um, so all of this empty space up here is where our instantaneous and average field would be very far from this matching condition. So we would not intuitively expect any polarization transfer at these, in these regimes up until this point. Um, but we do see polarization transfer and we even see improved polarization transfer uh, as with the pulse sequence that we've been pulling apart so far. Um, each of these dashed black lines are corresponding to a pulse area that has a net rotation of two pi n under the resonance frequency difference term. Um, and we see efficient polarization transfer uh, at uh, 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 under pulse areas where this rotation is some very small flip angle, uh, epsilon away from two pi, which is somewhat non-intuitive when the optimal excitation should occur at a net flip angle of about pi over two. Um, but in the end, we do end up achieving a net rotation of pi over two. It just ends up coming out of uh, repeated applications of this pulse over the full lifetime of the polarization transfer complex. Um, so now that we've worked extensively with the numerical simulations, uh, which clearly demonstrate the impact of two-state saber uh, and investigated the theoretical backdrop for these coherence transfer pathways to explain these, this behavior, um, we need to check experimentally to verify. Um, and I'm gonna pull a fast one really quick and switch up the pulse sequence just for no reason other than I have more data under these conditions. Um, so uh, zero field pulse would actually generate the same pattern with slightly more efficient transfer. Um, and I've shifted this phase space down appropriately just to match the pulse that we're applying. Um, anyways, uh, for this pulse sequence here, uh, if we hold the pulse field strength constant at 34 microtesla and sweep through the duration of that pulse, which would correspond to this blue line, we're pulling out a polarization trace that looks like this. Uh, and our experimental data would match this prediction extraordinarily well. Alternatively, we can hold the pulse duration constant at two milliseconds um, and uh, scan through the field strength, uh, which would correspond to this red line here and looks like this trace here. And once again, we see extraordinary agreement between experiment and our theoretical predictions here. Um, so this well-supported uh, pulse sequence demonstrates the efficacy of using a different theoretical framework for understanding some otherwise non-intuitive results. And it's also opening up some new routes for our uh, optimization of polarization transfer in different Sabre experiments that otherwise would not have been explored. Um, and with that, uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention and thank uh, Dr. Warren and my lab mates, as well as the Department of Chemistry, School of Medicine and Medical Scientist Training Program for all of their support. Um, thank you very much. I'll take any questions. Oops. Amazing talk. I think that, that helped for me to clarify, I think, some of the ideas that Warren introduced a little bit earlier in the day. Um, yeah, are, are there any questions? I don't see anything in the Q&A right now. I have a few, of course, but um, I'll give the opportunity if anyone has anything else. But I'll, I'll start off. I actually have a question about your chemical system. Or, or wait, we actually do have some. Danila, I'll let Danila ask a question. Yep, thank you. Yep. Yeah, I just, uh, maybe I missed it, but what is the reason to keep, uh, oh, by the way, great talk, yeah, uh, the keep three milliseconds, why do you always keep three milliseconds at zero field, is the reason for that? Uh, yeah, so um, I've looked at several different, uh, oops, sorry, so I've looked at a couple of different uh, regimes for kind of expanding out that, uh, the duration of that low field pulse there. Mm -hmm. um, the reason that three milliseconds, I think, is ending up being an optimum, it's, it's somewhat optimized, uh, is that uh, each of these uh, complexes is seeing this pulse packet uh, many, many times, which means that on average, you're actually going to get a fairly homogeneous excitation. Uh, whereas if I'm applying longer durations, obviously, this is very uh, uh, exaggerated here. If I'm applying longer durations in between, I'm going to miss some of the optimum excitations for each of those for different complexes. Does that answer your question? Maybe partial. I definitely need to think much more about all of this, but, but I remember one of the first papers about these ideas uh, from Nature Communications, uh, if I'm not mistaken, when you keep actually um, the field uh, at the level anti-crossing, and then you go far away to allow, as far as I understood, to allow the fresh parahydrogen to exchange. And yes. uh, so there's nothing like this here. So there is no like um, dependence on how quickly you can replenish the parahydrogen. 
Yeah, so that's that's actually a really interesting point. So um, you're talking about the coherently pumped saber sheath paper that our lab came yes, out with yes. a couple of years mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of a similar concept, but in this case, what we're actually doing is we're manipulating the actual the quantum dynamics of the system by by um, uh, allowing these pulses to actually couple together. So there, all of these pulses are acting on each complex multiple times over the lifetime ah, of the complex. I see. I Whereas see. the point for the coherently okay. pumped saber sheath paper was that we were just trying to excite as much as we could under the level anti-crossing matching condition. And then move far away from that matching condition to just reinitialize our system mm -hmm. in order to facilitate another optimized. Uh, oh, this is different. This is completely different. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a different concept. It's kind of toying with different uh, parameters in the saber system. Thank you. And maybe one last question. Uh, maybe I also missed it. How many uh, pulses? What's the number of n did you use? I, I didn't. Oh, sure. So I, I just applied this pulse sequence for like 30 seconds and depending on the, the simulation, or sorry, so I applied this pulse for 60 seconds for experiments and depending on the simulation that I do, I'm just applying it until I get a convergence in the in the final polarization. Mm -hmm. An experiment is done uh, as, as was previously done um, just by having your sample in the shield uh, with the control of the field and Yep, and simple and function generator. It's very easy to set up, very easy to apply. Um, it, it's not an incredibly complicated pulse sequence to be able to, to um, program into your generators. Um, yeah, and we use a liquid nitrogen parahydrogen generator to, yeah, it's pretty pretty right. simple to-, to Thank implement. you. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, we, we have a bunch more questions now, so I think we'll keep it moving. Um, Kirill uh, asked, would these pulse sequences also improve the saver of purity? And I guess I want to expand that. Um, have you tried this on any other chemical systems besides the purity and acetonitrile? Um, yes. So I've, well, well, I've done this on a 15N purity in sample as well, and I've seen the same exact results. Uh, I have much more extensive work done with acetonitrile just because it gives us much cleaner data, so it's easier to interpret and to, to kind of fit to our, our numerical simulations. Um, but yeah, it, it's- And, and just, just a quick experimental question to squeeze in here. What's the ratio of uh, purity and acetonitrile that you're using? I'm um, just using a, a 50 millimolar of pyridine and 100 millimolar of acetonitrile. Uh, I guess a question from Malcolm that Warren already addressed a little bit. Um, can one interpret the field cycling sequence as applying an oscillating field with a frequency matching with a frequency matching a desired transition in the system? Uh, so Warren already gave a partial answer, but. <laughs> um, interpret the, sorry, can you say that one more time? Yeah, so it's in the chat. Um, can one interpret the field cycling sequence as an as applying an oscillating field with the frequency matching an, a desired transition in the system? Um, I don't. I don't think I have a great uh, answer for that. Let me. Uh, I, I guess I can promote. I can allow Warren to give his input on that as well. Uh, I, I guess I will. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. We can, we could hear you for a second. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yep, we got you. Okay, so yeah, I would view this a little bit differently that it, you're not really matching a resonance frequency. You can come up with basically many, many ratios of those off pulses and on pulses that work or many ratios of negative and positive pulses that work. What you're doing is you're creating regimes where the effective J coupling is scaled down in this case, because for a lot of the time you're at very high field. So there is no effective J coupling and where you're still getting that small phase shift necessary to create the observable operator. So there's nothing magic about the three millisecond delay. You could come up with, come with, with an, an infinite number of different combinations, but in general, you need two fields to do this right. And sometimes it can be positive and negative, nearly equal field. Let me, um, I guess, Malcolm, I wanted to follow up on that as well, so. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We, we can hear you. Yeah, that was a fantastic talk, uh, Shannon. Thanks very much. And uh, really interesting stuff from you and Warren, of course. Um, uh, yeah, just my question maybe I don't know maybe there's a misunderstanding there but it just sort of looks to me and you know I might be I might be wrong I haven't thought about this of course but um, uh, I mean obviously if you're, you're doing like a square wave modulation of the magnetic field in some sense and you could imagine decomposing that into frequency components 
So you have like a sine wave and then some higher harmonics. So it sort of looks to me as if maybe all of those bands are sort of harmonics basically of the modulation you're doing. So that if you just used a pure sine frequency at, the, at, at a, a well-chosen frequency, maybe, you know, maybe that would work. I don't know. And then it may be an interpretation in terms of the energy level. You know, as you, as you modulate the magnetic field, then you're essentially modulating a lot more frequency difference between the two uh, isotopic types. So that would induce some sort of transition. So I'm just speculating that maybe there's a way of interpreting the data in that way. But as Warren says, the, you know, there's, there may be many different ways of viewing it, and that might not be the correct um, interpretation. But I, I would just think, suggest it might be worth exploring as a possibility. So I guess I'll just speculate that. So of course, she's showing cases with two unequal amplitude domains, which are not necessarily positive and negative with respect to one another. I talked about also some of the experiments where it looks more or less like square wave. And indeed, those spikes are related to the frequency content of the of a sine wave or a square wave, because those are the positions where you end up going through two pi or four pi or six pi of cycling of the magnetization. And so, and in fact, there's no reason why this has to be restricted to square waves. You are correct. What you're doing, the, the beauty of this particular system is that you can continuously vary, in effect, the chemical shift difference, the way we normally think about it in high field, or here, the, the field, the, the heteronuclear difference, to be positive or negative or anything else you want. And that's not a degree of freedom you normally have in high resolution NMR. So it lets you do some fun things. Thank you. I think Thomas had a question. I also had a question kind of based off of what Danilo is talking about as well. So I guess some of the work that you guys had previously done was around, I guess, trying to coherently match the, um, the field shifts with the um, hydride exchange. Would it be possible to combine, I guess, this two-state saber method with those previously demonstrated techniques where you're also then, I guess, cycling within a single like binding event, but then also cycling like with the hydride exchange as well. Uh, yeah, so that's that's definitely an initial application that that springs to mind when you look at this stuff. Um, I've done some theoretical work in that space, uh, and right now I'm not seeing an enormous impact on 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 polarization improvements overall by combining these two methods, um, just because we get our rate of transfer during this or under this pulse sequence is is much faster than the traditional. Uh, polarization transfer rate, which means that our eventual uh, equilibrium polarization, if you will, or final polarization that we're achieving there um, is higher. Once we add in those very lengthy delays, we start to just kind of uh, walk back on our polarization transfer rate. So we, we start to decrease that by interspersing those delays in order to reinitialize our complex. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Thomas, did you have a Question. Yeah, I just had one question. Shannon, uh, thank you so much for this beautiful talk. Um, can you show the uh, slide again where you had the blue, green, and red arrows showing the different things that happened during the state, like where you're selecting the pathways? <clears throat> yeah, perfect. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got just a little confused on the slide, and I was wondering if you could just clarify. Uh, you know, I guess you say that you there are certain parts in which you um, optimize basically the red arrows and certain parts where you optimize the blue arrows. I see. Now I understand a little bit better. The green is basically just the uh, symmetric counterpart of the blue. So because my question was going to be, would it ever make sense to think of a three-state method where <laughs> you give yourself even more flexibility and have like, you know, three different types of magnetic fields that you pulse? Uh, but now that I recognize the symmetry in the problem, yep. uh, I think I have my answer. Sorry, but you can of course comment on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it just ends up coming because that that JHH is going to be field invariant up until you get to really high magnetic fields. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it it's much more difficult for us to actually open that up to to have any sort of impact there. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Um... I guess John had one more question. Uh, do these resonances depend on the strength of the switching field? Uh, oh, oh, um, yes. So actually, no, not so much. The, the strength of the switching field is actually going to be the, 
the only constraint that we have on that is just our ability to build a solenoid that's going to be able to have a rise time that's uh, fast enough to approximate the square wave. Um, although we are looking into some sine wave stuff. Um, so that would be the only really restraint that we would have for that that field because it's just going to be the rotation during that time that's going to be important. So mm -hmm. yeah. So in some of these, I think you were using 40 microtesla and then some of the other ones you're using like 34 microtesla. I say yeah, the, the 34 micro Tesla was just a measurement that was made on our uh, uh, on our system. So it was experimental. Yeah, whereas this I can just put in whatever field that I want to and 40 seemed like a nice number. 